Good evening and welcome to the televised leaders debate for election 2021. I'm Michael Connors. In 10 days, Newfoundlanders and Labradorians will elect a new legislature. Tonight, on the floor of the House of Assembly, the leaders of the three major parties will debate the issues. Let me introduce the participants. Andrew Fury, leader of the Liberal Party. Chess Crosby, leader of the Progressive Conservative Party, and Alison Coffin, leader of the New Democratic Party. They are sitting tonight because of COVID protocols. We have a panel of journalists who've come up with questions with input from the public. The questions have not been shared with the parties in advance. Our panelists are Kellyanne Roberts of NTV, Peter Cowan of CBC, and Jane Aidy of CBC. Over the next hour, the leaders will pair off for a series of one-on-one -on -one debates and then end with closing statements. The first pairing is Andrew Fury and Alison Coffin, and our first question comes from Jane Aidy. Jane? Thank you. Thank you, Michael. The COVID-19 pandemic has exposed the inequities for frontline workers on low wages. Is it time for the province to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour? Well, thank you very much for that question. It's an incredibly important question. And uh, we have seen, of course, in this time of COVID-19, the gaps that exist in the social safety net of our province. The minimum wage is one tool that we can use to help people as they raise themselves and reach their full potential and reach the middle class. But it's not the only tool. We have an independent review panel in place that reviews the minimum wage every two years. And under our Liberal government, for the first time in the history of the province, we've ensured that it's tied to the consumer price index. So what that means is that it will go up every single year. We are, we are going to remain competitive with respect to the minimum wage, with respect to the Atlantic average. And what I'd like to do in terms of a policy instrument is to negotiate with the other Atlantic premiers to ensure that we are on par together, working together to use the minimum wage as one tool to help families reach the middle class. Thank you. Ms. Coffin. Uh, absolutely. New Democrats are firmly behind a $15 an hour minimum wage because no one who is working a 40-hour work week deserves to live in poverty. $15 an hour is uh, reasonable. It is not even a living wage. And anyone who is working to support their family deserves to be paid that reasonable wage. I have heard horrible stories about mothers who skip breakfast, feed their children, but go to work at grocery stores hungry because they can't afford enough money for both of them to have breakfast. That is absolutely abhorrent. Raising the minimum wage, the Liberal government had the opportunity to raise the minimum wage when they set this most recent uh, increase, but they did not raise it to $15 an hour. It was a lost opportunity, and the people of Newfoundland and Labrador are suffering as a result of that. It is shameful that uh, someone who said, if you've got $15 an hour, they would go buy a, a winter coat. Thank you, Mr. Beard. Thank you very much. Um, poverty is a complex issue. It's not owned by anyone in particular. If there's someone hungry in our province, we should all feel that pain. If there's someone struggling to get a hand up, we should all feel that. Look, there are many different tools that we can use to help what is a very complex issue and hanging it all on one particular wage is not right. We need to look at all the tools that we have in our toolbox including things like $25 a day childcare, access to affordable housing. Absolutely, we need to raise the minimum wage. Again, people need to be able to afford to live and work in this province and raise a family. Tying minimum wage to the CPI is a laudable idea, but if we simply increase the wage rate with the cost of living, we are keeping people in poverty. We can have a much better approach that is going to allow people to make their own decisions so they can buy the goods that they need. Again, we need to use all the tools available to us, including enhancing educational opportunities, support for childcare. The minimum wage is set by an independent review panel, reviewed every two years. So that takes the politics out of it. They seek the best evidence and make the best decisions based on what's presented. It's not a political decision. It's one that's independent of politicians. Right now, we're right in the middle of the country with respect to minimum wage. We want to make sure that we're offering competitive wages so that we can use that as one of the tools to help get people out of poverty. Ms. Cotton? Paying 
people for the hard work they do is the right thing to do. We do not want to be known as the place where you can come and get cheap labor. That is not what we want for Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. We work hard, we have a very good work ethic, and people deserve to be paid for the work that they do. Let's not keep people in poverty. Let's not abdicate our responsibility and give it over to a minimum wage committee. Let's take the bold step and let people be able to Thank afford you, to time. live here. And uh, we'll continue with that pairing. Our next question is from Kellyanne Roberts. Thank you, Michael. Andrew Fury has promised no mass layoffs in response to the, new, to the new NAEP ads. But how can the province balance the books if layoffs can't be a part of the conversation? Ms. Coffin? Well, that's an excellent opportunity to talk about minimum wage again. If we pay people more, those people are going to be able to pay more taxes, which increases revenue into our public coffers. By paying people a little bit more, it means that they're going to be less reliant on our social assistance programs. It means that we're not going to need as much money in our health care because people are not going to show up at the hospital because they haven't been able to afford their medication and they're not receiving as much critical care. They're not going to need as many rent subsidies. They're not going to need as much uh, supplement for their daycare. By paying people, we are giving them additional choice, but we are also increasing our tax revenues and we are also uh, uh, decreasing individuals' dependence on our social safety net, which of course means that we don't have to spend as much money in it. So balancing the books can be done by using the tools at our disposal, which includes raising minimum wage. Thank you, Mr. Fear. The question was about public sector layoffs. Look, right now we're in a global economic crisis. I've not seen a single economist recommend an austerity budget in these times. There are, the United States is arguing currently uh, in its government whether to borrow one trillion or two trillion dollars to help stimulate the economy. Now is not the time to take jobs out of the economy. There's no question that we have structural issues moving forward. However, it's not, this has taken us five, 10, 15 years to get where we are today. We need to make sure that we're putting in short, medium, and long-term strategies in order to rectify that. There's no single budget that's gonna fix this. There's no magic solution. Mass layoffs are not the answer. But, but, this, this, we didn't get in this fiscal predicament on the backs of the hard-working nurses and public servants of our province, and they won't, they won't be responsible for fixing it. Together, we'll come together with solutions and looking at programs, in this, in, but we can't even get to the medium-term strategies until we fix the acute fiscal issue in front of us, which is Muskrat Falls. It's refreshing to hear that we're not going to be cutting public sector jobs. And what we need to do is recognize the burnout that's happening with our nurses, with our paramedics, with our LPNs and the people who are in our healthcare sector. Not only do we not cut, we need to invest more in them. We are hearing too many stories about how nurses are at being asked to work double shifts, how people are being stressed because uh, there are extra demands on them than their workloads. There are uh, too often have we heard. Yeah, I've not only heard those stories, I've lived those stories side by side with those nurses struggling to find childcare as they're asked to do a double shift. It's not pleasant. And the, in order to right the fiscal ship of this province, we can't ask them to give any more. We can review the programs, but we first need to deal with Muskrat Falls. We need short, medium, and long-term strategies to right the fiscal ship of this province, starting acutely with Muskrat Falls. Well, you may have heard the stories. I don't think you are listening to the stories. We need to invest in our public services. We need to uh, hire more nurses, more LPNs. We need to hire more paramedics. We need to ensure that we have a robust public service to provide the public uh, to provide the public services upon which we all rely so investing in our public service and ensuring that the individuals who provide this care for us are not suffering from well, I've certainly not I've experienced the stories I've seen the paramedics come doing the double shift having to take a patient from one clinic to another I've lived them I understand the stress that they're under and the fiscal situation isn't theirs to bear alone in fact, it's not theirs to bear at all. We need to work together in order to fix the structural problems of this province. There's no, there's no doubt about it. We have challenges ahead. But unlike some of my opponents who think that we're bankrupt, we're not. We're not bankrupt of ideas. We have plenty of ideas and Thank opportunities ahead of us. Thank you very much. That's time. Uh, our next debate pairing is Andrew Fury and Chess Crosby. And our next question comes from Peter Cowan.
Thank you. Just this week, we saw economists from the C.D. Howe Institute release a report saying that the spending in this province is unsustainable and that hundreds of millions of dollars in cuts are going to need to be made. Exactly how much do you think spending needs to go down and how would you do it? Mr. Fury? Well, the first thing we need to do in order to tackle the fiscal deficit of the province is to deal with Muskrat Falls. 14, almost $14 billion is an anchor around the collective souls of Newfoundlanders and Labradorians brought to you by a former progressive conservative government. They've taken us to the edge of the fiscal cliff. Mr. Crosby has already declared that the province, the people of the province are bankrupt. I don't subscribe to that view and I know people at home don't either. The Newfoundland and Labrador that I know, the Newfoundlanders and Labradorians that I know are proud people and will fight for the economic opportunities ahead of us. We have to deal with Muskrat Falls first. I've already started with a strategy on that, securing the $840 million that was due in December. That will allow us the fiscal flexibility to negotiate a, f a, a new financial framework for that boondoggle and move forward then to deal with the structural issues of the province. Mr. Crosby? Well, now, Mr. Premier Fury is overselling uh, what he's already done in the space of seven months that he's been in office. The question here is about expenditures and what needs to be done to contain them. And he mentioned that $840 million uh, and makes it sound like that's some kind of a gift from Ottawa that we don't have to pay back sometime. That's not the case. That's just another can that the Liberal government has kicked down the road that we're going to have to deal with in only a few months' time. Look, uh, yeah, we have an expenditure problem, but that's only half the problem. The, uh, it requires us to go line by line through our expenses so we can make smarter decisions, be more efficient, do more with what we have. But as I say, it's only half the problem, and the other half is a lack of economic growth. And that's where the Premier doesn't understand that. His whole orientation is to cut. You can't cut your way out of an economic problem, out of a deficit problem. You have to grow your way out of it, laying off public sector union, public sector Mr. workers, and privatizing public... I have not public mentioned cuts sector. whatsoever. The only person who has mentioned cuts in the previous campaign was Mr. Crosby when he talked about cutting health care. Now, can you imagine the space that we would be in if Mr. Crosby was in charge cutting your health care in the middle or before a pandemic? I ask you what state the province would be in. Mr. Crosby, this, the people of the province aren't a business that you can write off and declare bankrupt when you think it's convenient for you. You've taken us to the fiscal cliff and want to take us over. Well, you know, we've talked about the same thing. That's the need to find uh, efficiencies in the way we spend money. The Premier has used exactly the same language I used. I talked about waste. He's talked about waste. Yes, we need to go line by line through our expenditures. But the difference between him and me is I want to do this in full consultation with frontline workers, uh, with union leaders, and with the public. And if we're talking about as do I, health, sir, and that's why we're using advocates. the public. That's why we're going to consult with the public broadly on any decision we make. But with, there is no magic bullet here. There is no one budget that's going to fix everything. Because of Muskrat Falls and the debt that's placed on Newfoundlanders and Labradorians, we have limited fiscal room to maneuver, and that's where we need to make sure we're working with the federal government, not against them. Mr. Crosby is campaigning to be the last premier of Newfoundland and Labrador, telling people he's going to declare it bankrupt as soon as he's in the premier's chair. We're not going to let that happen. Well, look, I'm honest with the people. I level with people. I look them in the eye. I tell them the hard facts and the realities. I don't use buzzwords like redesign the future. I don't use buzz buzzwords like have the best and the brightest come up with a plan and then not show them the plan but call an election before they can see the plan. I'm a straight shooter, and that's why I use words like bankruptcy. It's because it cuts to the heart of the matter Thank and you. tells people we got a problem, and I know Thank how you, to Mr. fix Crosby. it. Thank you, Mr. Crosby. And our next question for this pairing comes from Kellyanne Roberts. It was this province that wanted to build Muskrat Falls. It was only after much lobbying that the federal government agreed to back some of the loans to make it happen. How much responsibility does the federal government have to fix a problem created by this province? Mr. Crosby? Yeah, you know, I don't think that we can browbeat or arm twist the federal government into doing all that much that doesn't make sense. So obviously, and let's not forget that this is two governments, a conservative government in Ottawa and a liberal government in Ottawa successively gave 
huge guarantees to Muskrat Falls. Now that tells you something about them. They thought this project would be a benefit for the future. They thought this project would be a benefit for meeting our climate change obligations. It would be a benefit for our neighbors in Atlantic Canada. And they are our partners in Muskrat Falls. They have to recognize that. You can't guarantee $8 billion and more dollars worth of expenditures with full oversight, with eyes wide open, with taking on the burdens of that investment when some things about it, like the scheduling and the cost overrun, overruns, don't work out. They have to share the burden with us. Oh, thank you. I mean, Muskrat Falls is the number one issue in, this, in the point of no return for this, as Justice LeBlanc said, was under a progressive conservative government in 2013. I didn't create Muskrat Falls, but I'm committed to fixing Muskrat Falls. The way to do that is to work with our federal partners. Our forefathers and foremothers chose Canada because they believed in the Federation. They, shaw, they saw hope and optimistic opportunities ahead by joining a strong Federation, a strong centre. Mr. Crosby's interested in fighting and suing the federal government. I'm interested in working with them. And I already have evidence that it works. $840 million against this project. And we've already started in earnest a renegotiation of the Muskrat Falls financial, pro the, the financial deal, including having things on the table like equity, carbon credits, monetizing potential future energy costs. These are all the creative solutions that I've brought to the table and worked with the federal government in just the first five months. Give me four years. Again, he refers to the $840 million as if it's found money. That's just, uh, that's just uh, doing your normal prudent business practice of deferring uh, an amount that was due and is, uh, it makes no sense to pay it when it became due because the project is delayed. We're expecting now full power at the end of the year, not when it was originally expected. So uh, in a business-like manner, the levels of government agreed to defer the payment of that, of that amount. Of that amount. Uh, Mr. Fury makes reference to so, lawsuits. Uh, first of all, let's clear up something. The $840 million, sorry, is it still, is it still Mr. Crosby's? Uh, Go ahead. Okay, let's clear up something. The $840 million, there's two debt instruments and one Korea a deferral payment fund that we don't have to pay back. So half of that we don't have to pay back. The other debt instruments we're negotiating currently with the federal government. Now, Mr. Crosby wants to sue them. He's already told them that he thinks that we're bankrupt. How can you start a serious negotiation in earnest with our federal partners if you're, if you're using language like that, sir? That's irresponsible language, and it's playing chicken with people's ch paychecks, sir. Mr. Crosby? Yeah, well, he just said half that we don't have to pay back. If that's true, I guess that's a good precedent, isn't it? That's a, a good place to start in the negotiations. As to lawsuits, look, over a 35-year career as a lawyer, I've negotiated many settlements with lawsuits in the background. That's just how you get business done. Well, I, there's no question that we will continue to work hard with our federal partners. Uh, Mr. Crosby likes to see this as a binary choice between us versus f the federal government. Let's fight. Now is not the time to fight. Now is the time to work with our federal partners to ensure that we can get the best deal so that the electricity rates don't double. We need to work with our federal partners to ensure it. I didn't create Max Muskrat Falls, but I will fix it. Thank you very much. Our next pairing is Allison Coffin and Chess Crosby, and the question comes from Peter Cowan. This year, hundreds of millions of taxpayer dollars are going to go to prop up oil and gas developments in this province and keep a few hundred jobs. Large-scale investors have been pulling out of the oil and gas sector, not just because of concerns over climate change, but because of the financial risks as well. How much taxpayer money should be going in to prop up oil and gas developments in this province? Ms. Coffin? Certainly, we've put a great deal of money into oil and gas with the uh, potential for having some jobs when we restart our gentia. That is not good enough. We have seen twice in the last 10 years that the price of oil has dropped so substantially that oil projections uh, and, and oil investment have become unviable. I think that we need a reasonable solution to diversify our economy. The people working in the oil and gas industry do not need government uh, making poor decisions and giving them false hope when we know that these people are sacrificing their time with their families, they're sacrificing their bodies. They 
deserve much greater respect and we ought to provide for them a tangible future and a viable way for them to transition into other opportunities if that is what is available. But I think that investing again and again in multi-billion dollar corporations is Mr. wrong. Presby, you have to keep in perspective what uh, we have at stake in the offshore. There's enormous potential wealth that we can unlock in our offshore resources. We've already unlocked uh, wealth worth $22 billion to the Treasury of this province since the Atlantic Accord deal was entered into. We'll be unlocking more of that wealth as long as we can keep the offshore active, keep the companies interested in exploring here, keep the companies interested in, in developing here. Times are tough. We all know that. We've all experienced that. We've all felt that times are tough. They're feeling it too. They deserve our support. It's not pushing taxpayer money into a black hole. It's an investment in our future. It's an investment in jobs. It's an investment in growth. It's an investment in having an economy that can generate tremendous wealth for us on, in the coming years. Ms. Coffin. The people of Newfoundland and Labrador deserve government support, not the oil companies who make billion dollar profits and then turn around and say, you need to give us more money so we can take more profits out of our province. That is wrong. We need to put the money, especially the money that came in from the federal government, back into helping workers. That was the directive. It wasn't give billions or hundreds of millions of dollars to the oil companies so they can turn around and sue us. That is not Right. Mr. Crosby? Well, I think it's the workers that deserve our support. Uh, the, the whole idea of, uh, of supporting the offshore industry is to support the jobs and the tax revenues and the future jobs and the future of the province that we all uh, see as possible, as potential. In fact, we have a golden age coming around the corner in this province. I will never give up on this province. The offshore is how we're going to realize on that. The offshore offers a huge potential, absolutely, but it is foolish for us to throw good money after bad. There has been no promise of guaranteed jobs. There has been no promise that they are going to reinvest in Newfoundland and Labrador. It is smarter to invest in providing strong public services and a viable foundation for in, in, in environmental sustainability and protect our industry and let the profitable businesses make those decisions. A smart investment would be not giving uh, $41 million to Husky and then watching them lay off 70 workers the day, uh, the day after, as uh, Premier Fury has done just recently. A uh, smart investment would not be taking $170 million from the federal government and instead of putting it to work generating jobs and growth, parking it in uh, a bank account, which is what happened just before the election call. That's time. And uh, continue with that pairing. Our next question is from Kellyanne Roberts. Given the current financial situation of the province, most Newfoundlanders and Labradorians likely accept that not every service to rural communities in this province can be saved. Are you prepared to make the difficult decision to cut services to rural communities, particularly those that do not pay municipal taxes? Why or why not? Mr. Crosby? Uh, you know, you're talking about a way of life here. You're talking about you're talking about a way of life that many people find attractive. We have, uh, for example, St. Brendan's. That's an example in the district of uh, my good friend MHA, uh, PC MHA Lloyd Parrott. Um, everyone on St. Brendan's, he tells me, is employed. That island is contributing to this province. It's a tourist destination. It provides jobs to people. It uh, is part of the web of our way of life. We want to build on our tourist economy. That's uh, by preserving rural Newfoundland is the way we're going to do it. There are many ways. Look, if you th think we have an expenditure problem, you're right, we do. But the way we ad address that is collaboratively together by being open with sharing the approach to uh, the thinking about expenses with the people affected. Right. Having come workers. from rural Newfoundland and Labrador, from Joe Batts Farm, from Fort Shin, spending a lot of time around the bay now as well, 
I know how important it is for rural communities to have access to all of those services. It would be grossly imprudent to cut services to rural communities. That is a tacit form of resettlement, and I will not stand by it. If we want stronger communities, we need to invest in those communities. We need to empower those communities. We need to engage with municipalities and ensure that they have a seat at the table when decisions are being made for them and about them. We must engage. If we want to revitalize our economy, we need to revitalize Newfoundland and Labrador. It is paramount that we continue to provide services to rural Newfoundland and Labrador. And that means making sure that we finish the Trans-Labrador Highway. And that means making sure that we do not cut our ferry services. And that means making sure that we have a, a rigorous transportation. Well, the Premier has talked about everything being on the table. So if I were living in rural Newfoundland and Labrador, I would be concerned, and all the more concerned, because the much-touted report that is the Premier's blueprint for the future <clears throat> is not something that he wants to share with people in rural Newfoundland and Labrador. If we're talking about trimming and cutting, we should look at NALCOR bonuses, the huge bonuses that were just paid out. We should look at patronage hires. For example, Carla Foote. In terms of rural services, let's keep going on the things that are important to it. If we want a vibrant tourism industry, that vibrant tourism industry needs municipal structures around it. It needs services like schools and hospitals. It needs access to primary health care teams. We need to encourage doctors to come and set up in rural, uh, rural parts of Newfoundland and Labrador. We want to ensure that Labradorians have better access to the MTAP program. This is vital. Mr. Crosby? Well, as I was saying, there are lots of other things we should be looking at, such as overpaying for the new mental health facility by $40 million, uh, and it's going to take a year longer to construct it and get it, uh, and it's being built by a liberal-friendly company. We should look at things like reviewing our need for office space. After all, we've just seen a lot of people able to work from home. Do we need all the office space and empty buildings that I've seen around this province in my travels sitting empty and costing money to the government? We should start there. For example, one of the things that we've seen more recently is that when the Liberal government uh, came in and when Jordan Brown won a seat in Labrador West, they closed the Labrador Affairs Office in Labrador West. They took vital services away from Labradorians. We will insist that that Labrador <laughs> Affairs Office in a Labrador West is reopened because Labradorians deserve to have a direct conduit to their government. It is vital to protect our rural services. Our next pairing is Alison Coffin and Andrew Fury, and our next question comes from Jane Aidy. Jane? Thank you. Many connected to the fishing industry say there is a damaging lack of federal science being done on critical fish species like capelin. As our provincial, provincial representatives, are you prepared to make a case to Ottawa for more funding for science? Or is it time for the province to make a major investment of our own in the science of this renewable resource? Ms. Coffin? Absolutely. I, I do believe that uh, investing in our fisheries is a vital thing to do. The better knowledge we have, the more science we have, the better able we are, uh, we better able we are to manage our fishery. We know we, we are all still reeling from the, the gross overfishing and mismanagement that we saw from uh, decades of liberal and conservative governments giving away quotas. So if we don't manage our fishery properly, we are going to see another collapse in that industry and that would be inappropriate as well. So good science gives us good decision making, which will of course improve our fishery. We know that the fishery is one of the, uh, is, has employs more individuals directly than the oil industry. It is only right to protect those jobs, to ensure that people have the opportunity to go to work in something that has such great history and tradition for us, but is such a vital part of our economy. Well, thank you so much, Jane, for that question. As we all know, the fishery is vital to who we are as Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. It's the reason why we're here. It needs to be the reason why we continue to be here. It's a renewable resource that has tremendous value. 17,000 people working in this industry, over a half a billion dollars contributed to our GDP annually. This is an incredibly important industry for all of us. It's why we're here. It's a renewable resource. It has to be why we remain here. 
I've talked to the union just a couple of weeks ago. I've talked to fish harvesters around the province, including just recently in Ingle, and I've heard the challenges around science. I don't believe the answer is duplicating a full second bureaucracy, but I do agree with the stem of the question. We need to hold Ottawa's feet to the fire. They spend $3.3 billion every year on, on DFO and, and from Ottawa. We need to make sure the science is sound and they're listening, listening to our fish harvesters who understand the science and can help I, direct I, I, them. And I don't think I actually heard uh, Mr. Fury say that, yes, he would commit to uh, putting more funding into science around fisheries. I do believe that that is vital. And if we do engage with uh, developing uh, additional resources and scientific data around the fisheries, that will go directly into our university. That will go directly into our uh, to the Marine Institute. That will go directly into the College of the North Atlantic's repository of good skills. It improves diversification. We, we have a world-class product with a world-class workforce. We need to ensure that the barriers are being eliminated. One of those barriers is science. We may need to make sure that Ottawa and the federal DFO department is doing what they can, listening to harvesters, working with us in a partnership to ensure that it's the best science making the best decisions for the harvesters. We know that there's barriers to entry. I've heard it from, fisher, from fishermen and fisherwomen and from uh, the, the union itself. Thank you, Ms. Coppin. We need to invest in our fishery, absolutely, but let's protect our resources as well. Better, better science will allow us to better ensure that we are developing an even higher grade product that will be able to protect our natural resources and ensure that they will come, the, the, the benefits of that will come back to Newfoundlanders and Labradorians, especially those working in our fishery. So investing in things like Capelin science, absolutely, but also aquaculture and also looking at uh, processing fa factors. So we're both in agreement, which is good that we need to continue to follow the science and make the investment in the science. But I really think that we need to work with our federal partners here and keep their feet to the fire to ensure that they're investing the appropriate amount of money for the right science, for the right science for the fish, for fish harvesters around this province. We also need to look at eliminating barriers so that there can be new entrants into the fishery. We need to make this a sustainable, renewable industry that can grow the province and grow our families into the future. Thank you. Uh, continuing with that pairing, our next question is from Peter Cowan. I've talked to a lot of voters who are really frustrated with this election, from when it was called to the lack of discussion about financial challenges to the fact that two out of the three parties still haven't released a platform. Voters that I've talked to think the parties are putting their own interests ahead of that of the voters or democracy. If you form government, how will we know that you'll put the interests of the people ahead of your own or your party's interests? Thank you, Mr. Fury. Well, thank you for that question, Peter, on election timing and, and democracy in general. And let me assure you, I struggled with the election call. I said I wouldn't call an election before a budget. You guys all asked me that as media, before a budget in 2020. I said I wouldn't call one by the end of 2020, and I didn't. However, the law is such that we need to have one in 2021. I always said that I'd abide by the law, and I did. There's no great time to have an election, but right now, as we emerge from a pandemic, as we emerge from a global economic crisis, the people of this province deserve a stable government. When you're sitting across negotiating with Ottawa or negotiating with big oil companies, they need to know that you have a mandate from the people. I'm very proud to have a mandate from the Liberal Party. I'm very humbled to have a mandate from the people from Humber Gross Morn. I need a mandate from the people of the province. Ms. Coffin? I'm pretty sure that our platform is very clear that we are speaking to the people of Newfoundland and Labrador and we are going to advocate for the people of Newfoundland and Labrador. From uh, ensuring that seniors have dental care to ensuring that there are even more home care hours to help our aging population to giving a solid minimum wage to the folks who especially everyone who has been working in the front lines during COVID, they deserve to be paid appropriately. There are far too many vulnerable people in, the, in this society, and I do believe that New Democrats are the only ones who are speaking up loudly and clearly for them. If we want to talk about the right time for an election, well, the right time for an election 
could have been after the Green Report. If you wanted a solid mandate, then why did you not tell the people of Newfoundland and Labrador what you intend to do, or at least what we were going to debate in the House of Assembly, and let us see the Green Report beforehand? If we wanted a safe election, then perhaps we could have waited until after the vaccine was rolled out, when everyone was a little bit more certain that they were going to be safe, and they could vote without fear of getting sick. So there is no question, unless you have a crystal ball, the only thing that's certain in this pandemic is the uncertainty. We thought we had a line on supply chain for the vaccine that's proven to be less, less reliable than we thought. We need a solid mandate, a stable government to negotiate the future of the, for the people of Newfoundland and Labrador. I hope it's mine. That's why we're here. People can decide. With respect to your second point of your question, Peter, with respect to the policy, we've been releasing policies every single day from investments in technology to investments in long-term care, investments in seniors' care. Coffin. And again, why haven't you shown us the platform before we got to our debate? We are going into the polls for advanced polls on Saturday. Are we just going to wait for dribs and drabs of announcements to come out? Or will you give us the full platform? I think that the people of Newfoundland and Labrador deserve to know what they are voting for. And if that means that you are not going to cut public sector cuts, then come out and put it in your platform. But I don't believe that, and I'm sick and tired so of... We've already said that we're not going to cut it, and that's just being loose with the truth. What your platform that you released today, Ms. Coffin, was a series of media releases that you had already done, and I respect that because that's what we've been doing, the same thing. We've been releasing policy announcements every single day of this campaign trail, and our platform will be out tomorrow with fully costed, I noticed yours wasn't, fully costed so that the full public can engage and understand where we're going together for a sustainable future in Newfoundland and Labrador. And again, I go back to we need to ensure that the, the most important things for the people of Newfoundland and Labrador are brought forward. And in the series of announcements that I have heard, I have not once heard either one of the other parties say we will have dental care for people or that we will offer home care rebates or that we are going to help them with their heating costs. What I have seen is decades of liberal and conservative governments making big promises before an election that they turn around and back out of immediately after that election, and I won't stand for it. Thank you. Uh, our next debate pairing is Chess Crosby and Andrew Fury, and our question comes from Kellyanne Roberts. Thank you. Many viewers have written to us with concerns that they can't get a family doctor. How will you address the shortage and access to family doctors in the province? Mr. Crosby. Thank you. Uh, I'm sitting here feeling like the net in a ping pong ball, uh, a ping pong game as the ball goes back and forth between my two colleagues here. So thanks for the question. Um, uh, what we got to do is listen to and work with the NLMA, our physicians here in Newfoundland and Labrador. It's a, a fantastic, incredible um, sight to behold that uh, how dissatisfied uh, our physicians are with this liberal government, uh, headed up by Premier Fury, himself a physician, and a health minister, himself a physician, and yet the uh, ph physicians collectively and through the organization that speaks for them are collectively tearing out their hair that they can't get anywhere towards solving the problem of having 90,000 of our residents without a family doctor. No action on that. Uh, thank you for the very important question. I'm the only one here who's been on the front lines of health care and I know how frustrating it can be. My sister Rebecca is a family doctor. My wife, Allison, is a family doctor. I know the struggles that they face. I know the struggles that all family doctors face around the province. We want to work with and will work with and have worked with the NLMA and the Nurses Union to ensure that we're developing a team concept for primary care. We need to use all the tools available to us and recognize that this time of disruption in health care can be valuable, as we've seen with virtual care, telemedicine, and e-health. We were pioneers of telemedicine under Dr. House. We can be pioneers and lead the way with e-health into the future, bringing family doctors and teams straight to patients. I've, the, the new graduates are being taught in medical school to practice as a team, yet when they go out, they're not given the supports to, to accomplish that. They're often practicing by themselves. We need to change that paradigm. Mr. Crosby? Well, uh, you know, again, I come back to relations with the NLMA have never been worse, and yet we have uh, physicians supposedly running the government. So uh, that one I don't get. 
with all the knowledge that they bring to the system, they can't seem to solve the problem or satisfy the NLMA that they're even on the way to solving the problem. Uh, it's not only a problem of access to physicians or having a physician, it's when you can call a physician or that's get to a physician, true, you don't sir, get any attention. I think it's my time here now, but that's frankly not true. Uh, we have a good relationship with the NLMA. In fact, they're part of the Health Accord, and we've been talking with them about primary care reform. When I met with them during my leadership, they said that that was one of their top priorities. I recognize it as a priority because I've seen the frustration from family doctors. We need to use this time of disruption to reimagine and reinvent how we deliver primary care around the province so that it's meeting the needs of our citizens. Well, I've just come back from a trip across the island and uh, on the doors, because I've knocked doors with my colleagues, PC candidates all across the island, uh, on the doors and in the Tims and in other venues in the supermarkets, I'm constantly getting stories from people about how, uh, if they even have a physician, it takes them six weeks to get a call with the physician so they can get an order for blood work. There's no question we need to reinvent how we're doing primary care. Again, I come back to the way Physicians are being educated now. They're educated to practice in a team, which is appropriate. You don't want to be the sole practitioner stranded by yourself in rural Newfoundland and Labr Labrador anymore. We get that. We need to change how physicians practice. I heard firsthand the frustrations from a family doctor in Porta Basque. He's a friend. He was, he was frustrated pulling his hair out that, that he couldn't manage his practice. But we need, he recognized the opportunity ahead with telemedicine, virtual health, e-health and that we can work together to change the Thank paradigm you. in primary health care. We'll continue with this pairing, and the next question is from Jane Aidy. Jane? Thank you. Many sectors, including the tourism industry, have taken very direct hits during this pandemic. What is your plan to help this industry recover and improve the overall economy while the pandemic continues? Uh, Mr. Fury? So the tourism industry is incredibly important uh, to the people of Newfoundland and Labrador and incredibly important to me. In fact, it's in a... It's an important economic driver, not just to the province, but to the people of my beautiful district of Humber Grossmoor. We need, there's no question, the external forces hitting the tourism industry are hurt, and they're, a lot, uh, they're mainly out of our control. The airline industry is one of the toughest hit around the world. So we need to, as a government, be sure that we're positioning our tourism product so that it's ready for when the, the flights return. We need to be putting pressure on Ottawa to support their airlines, to make sure that the routes are protected so that our tourism product, which we know is world class, can be delivered around the world when the time is right again. Mr. Crosby. Yeah, well, what the tourism industry needs, uh, <clears throat> it has to be supported uh, like any hard pressed industry, like oil and gas. Uh, like hospitality, uh, but what it really needs is to get back up and running again. It needs to get back into jobs and into a growth mode. Uh, here, the Premier mentioned air access. Um, it was his government, his Liberal government, who cut the position of coordinator for or director of air access. We could usefully bring that position back so that we could know how to strategize with Ottawa. We've just heard that the airport in Gander is now no longer serviced by Air Canada. Where is the national government on this? We just saw, for example, that uh, Marine Atlantic, which brings so many people to, the, to this island and eventually on to Labrador, has had a fear hike, a substantial fear hike. That's going to drive the cost of food up. It's going to drive, it's going to make it more expensive for people to come here to support the tourist industry. Where was the Premier when that happened? I didn't hear a peep out of him. And I didn't hear a peep out of his cabinet of change makers either. Uh, thank you. That's because we were too busy making the changes, including dedicating $25 million to help the tourism sector, continuing to pressure Ottawa on my weekly phone calls with the Prime Minister about the tourism sector. It's one that he's hearing loud and clear. We frankly, I need to make sure that our product, which is world class and world renowned and we're all proud of, we all recognize it for, as a, for its cultural significance as well as its economic impact. We need to make sure that that product is supported so that it can be well positioned when th once it returns to normal. Mr. Crosby. Well, we're all impressed to know that uh, the Premier has weekly phone calls with the Prime Minister, except I think we'd all like to know what the results of that are. What's being accomplished? Where's the blueprint for the future? Where's the meaningful support for the offshore sector? 
excluded from any federal support was support for exploration. That was a specific condition of the support that the Trudeau government, the money that was given to this province, it excluded any support for exploration, and it's exploration that supports the future. I want results. I can talk about results. In just the first five months, $320 million towards oil and gas. It allowed us to be creative and flexible and create our own incentive program. But we're talking about tourism, not about oil and gas. They're both equally important drivers of our economy, and any government, whether it's mine or someone else's, must recognize the significance of that and the importance of the women and men who work in these industries. The tourism, again, is an incredibly valuable product for us, and we need to make sure we're supporting it. That's why I created the Tourism Task Force. So, um, you know, it would help if we had um, we, something we've been calling for uh, steadfastly for months, point of entry testing. For rotational workers, it would help them, but it holds out hope for getting our tourism industry back on its feet and not have another terrible year like we did last year in the coming summer. Thank you very much. Uh, our next pairing is uh, Chess Crosby and Allison Coffin, and our next question comes from Peter Cowan. Many people of color and indigenous people in this province face racism every day. Even an MHA has had to apologize for language that some saw as racist. During this campaign, there's been talk of building statues to recognize the importance of indigenous people, but how will you build a province that removes racism that some people see as systemic in Newfoundland and Labrador? Mr. Crosby. Yes, thank you. Um, well, it involves a lot more than just changing statues or getting rid of statues. Uh, I think on that one, it's more important to have historical con context than it is to try to erase history. Look, we all live with a terrible heritage of racism. We're still living with it now. It occasionally erupts. Um, what you've got to do is you need to have a policy of zero tolerance for racism. And when I form a government, we will have such a policy, zero tolerance for racism involving anyone, whether it's our indigenous citizens <clears throat> or uh, new Canadians, new Newfoundlanders and Labradorians who come here to make their home in this province. And I want to see many more of those people in the future. Racism is not something we can tolerate or bullying or harassment as we've seen in this very house that we sit in in the recent past. Ms. Coffin? Reconciliation means tangible actions. We hear horror stories of children being in care and, and removed from their cultural backgrounds and their cultural identities. We need those tangible actions and one of the very first things we need to do is we need to do that inquiry into children in care. Not only that, we need to ensure that mental health and addiction services are culturally relevant and accessible to them. We need to ensure that uh, indigenous individuals and anyone who is the subject of racism are incorporated into the decision making. They are the individuals who are going to be able to forge our way forward. They are partners in decision making. They know what works for them. We also ought to talk about uh, indigenous led childcare, trauma informed childcare, culturally based and indigenously led. People who are uh, subject to racism are the best people to talk to to address racism. Mr. Crosby? Three years ago and more now, Prime Minister Trudeau went to Goose Bay and he tendered an apology to uh, the victims of uh, residential schools, the Labrador residential schools case that I was involved in. I had occasion to spend overnight it, and there's still no action on that. And I say, that's a liberal promise made by a liberal premier and no action to this day. Ms. Coffin. I'm very proud to say that 18% of the candidates, uh, New Democratic candidates, are indigenous, which means that they are going to be able to guide our policies and discussions in a far better way than I'm going to be able to do so myself. So incorporating more candidates and greater representation in the House of Assembly is absolutely vital in addressing race racism. Let's be reasonable. Let's start talking about things like food security on the coast of Labrador and address why that's happening. Mr. Crosby? Uh, yeah, so, you know, uh, you've got to make the effort. And when I was in Labrador recently, uh, two weeks ago, with uh, 
Torngat MHA, Leela Evans. Uh, I did spend overnight in Nain. I'm told it's the first time that uh, a party leader has done that in anybody, anybody's memory. And I had a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with President Lamp. And what he basically said to me is, it can't be head-to-head, -head, it has to be heart-to-heart, -heart, and that's how you achieve reconciliation. I would like to point out that we also need to talk about missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. It is far past the time to implement the calls for justice in the National Enquiry, and I think that is a very good step to confronting racism, and that is one of the key steps that we're going to need to ensure that anyone who is Indigenous and people of colour, black individuals, who are all incorporated in our racism policy. Thank you very much. Uh, continuing with that pairing, our next question is from Jane Aidy. Thank you. The pandemic has drawn attention to the escalating mental health needs in this province. In 2017, British Columbia created a Ministry of Mental Health with a primary focus on mental health and addictions issues. Since then, four other provinces have done the same. Would you take similar action? Ms. Coffin. Absolutely, that's an excellent idea. And we know that our mental health problems in Newfoundland and Labrador have, have escalated during COVID. We, uh, people are suffering because they do not have work. They're very concerned about the uncertainty of our province and the fact that we don't know what's coming after this election and once we see the Green Report. The, the calls to our mental health services have absolutely skyrocketed during COVID. So it only makes sense to dedicate a standalone entity to address mental health and addictions. Addictions also have, have exacerbated during COVID. And I think we need to be able to support individuals who are struggling with addictions, who are struggling with a variety of mental health issues, and put in place a solid framework that allows support that is easy to access. Far too often I hear people saying, I've made a call to mental health and I've told that I have to wait six months or a year to get that services, and that is inappropriate. Mr. Crosby. Yes, thank you, uh, mental health. You know, I'd like to situate the topic of mental health first and first of all in the context of jobs and growth because I think we all understand, we understand intuitively and by experience that when uh, people have an economic lifeline, when they feel their future is secure, when they feel that they can uh, get a decent job and earn a decent living and support their families, then mental health issues are much uh, more controllable when people lose their jobs, as we've all seen happening recently, when people um, fear for the future, when they experience economic insecurity, that's when a whole host of social evils uh, happen and they're all rooted in mental health. So there's an intimate relationship between the mental health issue, jobs and growth, and it's jobs and growth that we have a detailed plan for to implement and will bring us jobs and growth and therefore be the better lack, mental health the, in the lack future. of jobs and the lack of growth have exacerbated our mental health problems far more people are looking for this and just saying we want more jobs is not going to do it perhaps we do need jobs but they ought to be the people who provide mental health services let's invest in counselors let's invest in a more robust mental health system let's make it easier to access those mental health services it's too long, it's inappropriate to wait too long and make people sit on a waiting list while they're contemplating uh, depression, anxiety, depression. suicide. <laughs> I like Allison, but not enough to give her all my time. Um, so just to come back to that, we're, we want to unlock the potential of the Newfoundland and Labrador economy by cutting taxes and incentivizing job growth cutting red tape, a D which we get now is not good enough, we must have an A, we have to cut the tax on jobs that prevents businesses from hiring more people, and we have to have a local hiring policy to make sure that tradespeople in this province get jobs first. Again, mental health is a priority, and saying we need to invest in jobs is not making the wait for the person who says I need to get in to see a psychiatrist or a counselor or someone who's going to help me through this crisis right now 
saying jobs is not enough. We need tangible action. We need counselors. We need lower wait times. We need a mental health facility that doesn't look like it came from a Charles Dickens novel, and that needs to be done in, in a format that is not a P3. Ms. Crosby. Well, I agree we, we don't need a Dickens facility, uh, but I don't agree with the premise that we need a standalone Ministry of Mental Health. Uh, I think that uh, it needs to be uh, a focus uh, that cuts across all departments of government and not put in a silo all by itself. Thank you very much. And that's it for the debate segment of the evening. We are now going to move on to closing statements. The first closing statement comes from Andrew Fury. Thank you, Michael. Since stepping into the role as Premier back in August, I've had one constant directive for my team. Always, always move forward. Because momentum must keep building. In just five months, that momentum has seen a response to COVID-19 that's kept our infection numbers low, got our kids safely back to school, and made the province one of the safest places in the envy of the world. We said we'd bring in $25 a day child care, and we did. We said we'd work with Ottawa, and we have. That relationship has already yielded $320 million for oil and gas and more than $480 million to start help with Muskrat Falls. We furthered Indigenous reconciliation, started a health accord, and invigorated our booming technology sector. We are rising to the challenge. This is just some of what we've accomplished in the first few months. Imagine, my friends, together what we could accomplish in four years. I respectfully ask for your support to a liberal for a Liberal government, and together we all will rise to the challenge. And next, our closing statement is from Ms. Coffin. Thank you very much. The poor choices of Liberal and Conservative governments have brought our province to a place of financial uncertainty. And nothing that I have heard here tonight has given me any reassurances that it's going to get better. I fear that we are going to see more broken promises and, and um, vague uh, references to we're going to make it better. People are struggling to afford a good life here in Newfoundland and Labrador. If we want a different future, we need to make different choices. Like raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour, which puts more money in people's pockets so people can afford a better life. New Democrats are proposing smart, practical changes that will help you and your family get by. Changes that will make our province a more attractive place to live, work, and raise a family. Every new Democrat elected will fight to make life more affordable for you and your family. Thank you very much. And our final closing statement comes from Chess Crosby. Uh, thanks, Michael. And I want to thank everyone who's participated in making this possible. In this election, you have a clear choice. Cuts or growth. It's that simple. My liberal opponent has already given up, but not me, not our PC party. I see vast, untapped potential. I see thousands of skilled workers and new graduates hungry for opportunity and capable. I see business leaders eager to expand and create jobs. I see untapped mines, oil and gas, forests, fisheries, farms, value-added operations, technology. I see the limitless potential of tourism, summer and winter, urban and rural. I see a thriving future for all of us, from the tip of the Torngats, the valleys of Gross Morne, to the downtown of St. John's. And that's why I'm here to fight for what I believe in with a plan to deliver. Let's choose growth, choose a bright future for this province, and together we will bring back jobs. Please do, as my daughter Rachel asked in the video, please elect my dad. Thank you very much, Mr. Crosby. Well, that is it for Debate 2021. Now, a reminder, the advance polls will be open this Saturday, February 6th. The final chance to vote is Election Day, Saturday, February 13th. Uh, now, the deadline for mail-in ballots uh, to apply for those expired yesterday, but for information on other methods of voting, you can visit the Elections NL website. I'd like to thank all of the leaders for participating. Andrew Fury, Chess Crosby, Alison Coffin, thank you very much. And thank you to our panel, Kellyanne Roberts, Peter Cowan and Jane, Jane 80. Thank you all very much for participating. Thank all of you at home for watching this evening. I'm Michael Connors. Good night.